am honored to be here. As Jacob declared, uh, I pastored this place for a long time. Now I oversee churches in all the, the Northwest. And uh, again, it's an honor to be here, to be a part of this Advent uh, series called Here I Am. Uh, Advent is really the celebration of the period of time in which culminated in Jesus' birth, where he, in essence, said, Here I am, the Savior of the world. Uh, John, one of his followers, simply described it as he wrote it out in his gospel, the word became flesh and dwelt among us. Uh, there's a translation that says that he pitched his tent among us. I love that. He just moved into the neighborhood and started to reveal who God was by living with us. It's called the incarnation. It's Jesus or God putting on flesh and living amongst us. Uh, I'm also very honored that I would get to speak today on the uh, Gift to the World Day. It was an organization called Advent Conspiracy that started to rock me all those years ago. Um, they talked about a thing called stupid poverty. And it just, again, rattled me because the assault that they were making was on us as Americans in our culture. I don't know if you know this, but last year Americans spent $850 billion on themselves at, Christ at Christmas. $850 billion we spend on ourselves. And they brought to light this interesting statistic, and that is that every six minutes on the face of the earth, a child dies of waterborne disease. A child dies every six minutes because the drinking water that they drink causes them to get a disease that takes their life. And what is interesting about that is that it is estimated that $10 billion would eradicate that reality from our world. Just $10 billion. And actually, as I launched Gift to the World way back then, I cussed for the one and only time in church as I shared that story. I stood on this platform and said, here's something I don't know if you know, but every six minutes, a child dies of a waterborne disease, and then I paused. And what's interesting is that it doesn't seem that you give a, and then I said the word, that word. And I paused for effect, and said, and quite honestly, most of you are offended that I used that word and I said it again. More offended by that than the fact that every six minutes a child dies of a waterborne disease. That was how I launched the gift to the world. And I said to them, why don't we just spend a little bit less on ourselves at Christmas and pool all of that money and see what God will do? I said it this way. I said, why don't you buy one less sweater and take that money and give it in this offering? And Steve Goodwin, who owns a men's clothing store called The Haberdasher, who went to church here at that time, came up to me afterwards and said, Dave, can't we talk about giving up something besides a sweater? I need to swell, sell sweaters <laughs> in order to give to the church. So I didn't say sweaters again. <laughs> but here's what's interesting about what we've done, is that over these years, we've given over a million dollars to charities. That we have provided clean water and all of these projects are tied to the gospel and gospel presentation to over 100,000 people over these years. So literally we are bringing clean water to an area as big as Yakima. We have pastoral training schools in Pakistan that are affecting one of the least reached peoples of the, of the world. And our local projects every year have done incredible good. Everything from putting a roof on the Madison House, a Union Gospel Mission youth facility, to helping the schools that we've adopted, and this year to Camp Hope. So in this Advent season, you have just been given an opportunity to be part of a conspiracy that says, let's live different. Let's live different. As I talk with you today, <clears throat> I'm going to tell you three stories. I'm going to tell you a Bible story, and I'm going to relate it to your life. So here's the first story. 
Over the Thanksgiving holiday, <clears throat> I decided that I'd wear the same shirt every day. I just wanted to see if my kids would recognize that dad's got the same shirt on again today to see if anyone noticed. My second daughter noticed. She just kind of looked me up and down and said, you had that shirt on yesterday. <laughs> but none of the rest of them even noticed. And my hope was is that they were having little conversations that as dad's getting older, hey, I wonder if dad knows he's got the same shirt on he had on yesterday. <laughs> I shouldn't pick and play on my kids like that, but I thought it would be fun. So here's the application to your life. Are you changing? Are you changing? Or are you the same? There's a new metric for Christians. We are not being declared and called Christians just because we declare we're one. As a matter of fact, too many people are declaring that they are Christians and yet they don't live anything like Jesus. The new metric is a transformed life. Has your life changed? There's been a scientific study because there are so many attacks coming against the Christian church, especially in America. So a scientific study was done by an organization and it was really testing to see if Christians' lives are really changed, if they're really better because they follow Jesus. And here's what it found. Christians are the primary source of secular charitable giving. The primary source. And they give to victims no matter what the victims' beliefs are. They just give. Christians dominate the ranks of blood donors. Christians enjoy superior mental health. Christians also enjoy superior physical health. Christians read more. And this is a really important one, but Christians are less likely to believe in the occult, UFOs, and Bigfoot. Christians are more apt to marry, less likely to divorce. And Christians are far, 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 far less likely to abuse. Christians are more likely to be involved in youth-related activity as coaches and mentors. Christians enjoy their sex life more. Christian students perform better in school and on tests. And finally, Christians enjoy their sex life more. <laughs> Wait, did I say that already? <laughs> oh, sorry about that. When I cussed in church, there was a young fella sitting back in that area over there. He'd just gotten out of Sundown M Ranch that week. His life had been destroyed by the abuse of alcohol and drugs, and he sat there and he said, when you cussed, I wasn't even a Christian, but that's what offended me, that you would cuss in church. And he said, as I was sitting there letting that roll around in my head, I thought, look at me. I'm not even a Christian, and I'm offended, and I'm, I'm being hypocritical. And at the end of that service, that young fella gave his life to Jesus. Now what's interesting about that story is that I heard that story because that young fella is now my financial advisor. His life has been completely transformed by what Jesus has done. Have you changed? Would you describe the work that God has done in your life as transformational. So here's the Bible story that I want to share with you today. It's a uh, here I am moment as this particular individual responded to God. His name is Samuel. Uh, Samuel is a figure who in our Bibles is a key 
player in the Old Testament and a key player in the life of the Jewish people, the Hebrew people, because Samuel was the prophet in the land during the period of time where they went from this long period of being ruled by judges to a new period. They cried out because they wanted a king. So Samuel's the one who prayed for Saul first and then prayed for King David, who became the king after him. And he is venerated as a prophet by the Jews, by Christians, and by Muslims today. So let me read the story and I'll fill in some blanks. It goes like this in 1 Samuel chapter 3. The boy Samuel ministered before the Lord under Eli. In those days, the word of the Lord was rare. There were not many visions. One night, Eli, whose eyes were becoming so weak that he could barely see, was lying down in his usual place. The lamp of God had not yet gone out, and Samuel was lying down in the house of the Lord where the ark of God was. So he was in the temple, laying there sleeping. Then the Lord called Samuel, who was sleeping in another place. Samuel answered, here I am. And he ran to Eli and said, here I am, you called me. But Eli said, I didn't call Go back and lie down. Can you imagine this old man getting woken up? So he went and lay down. Again, the Lord called Samuel. And Samuel got up and went to Eli and said, Here I am, you called me, my son. Again, can you imagine this old timer? Pretty cranky. I did not call. Go back and lie down. Now Samuel did not yet know the Lord. So Samuel had not yet understood how to discern how God was speaking to him. The word of the Lord had not yet been revealed to him is how it's described. Then Eli, who was probably sitting there staring at the ceiling because he'd been woken up in the middle of the night, realized that the Lord was calling the boy. So Eli told Samuel, go and lie down. And if he calls you, say, speak, Lord, for your servant is listening. So Samuel went and lay down in his place. The Lord came and stood there calling as at at other times, Samuel, Samuel. Then Samuel said, speak, your servant is listening. And God began to speak to Samuel and told him things that were about to unfold. Again, this is the start of a long life of hearing and following God for Samuel. As stated in the end of this chapter, it says this, the Lord was with Samuel as he grew up, and he let none of Samuel's words fall to the ground. So in other words, God was on this kid. And all Israel, from Dan to Beersheba, recognized that Samuel was attested as a prophet to the Lord. You need to understand something about Samuel. He was a miracle child. His mom was barren. Uh, She was one of two wives that a man had. And the other wife just was relentless in picking on and making fun of her because she was having children for this husband and uh, and Hannah was not. So Hannah would go to to the temple and she would just pray and she'd lay down in the temple and plead with God. As a matter of fact, she was doing that one time, and and Eli saw her, and because her lips were moving as she was praying, he just assumed that she was drunk and went up and challenged her on coming into the the temple in such a state. And she told her story that she is pleading with God for a son. And if she has this son, she's going to give him to God. So she did get to have that son. And when she had weaned that son, she brought him to the temple and presented him to Eli. And that little boy grew up in the temple. Eli was basically his only adult. So when this story unfolds, the one I just read you, Samuel's 12 years old. That's what happened to him. Now, I, I want to pause here because our kids were just in here. But over the course of the years, and it's, the truth, we we want an opportunity to present the gospel to your kids. And we do it in an age-appropriate way in our children's ministry. And it's one of the most important things that that you can do as a Christ follower with your children. And I think it's one of the most important things you could do with your life is to share it with a child and help them in an age-appropriate way understand what God's saying and what he's doing and how he works. In this particular time, God had been silent for a long time. And it was primarily because the leaders were corrupt and the people were corrupt. People weren't obeying the law or doing anything that God wanted them to do. So why would God actually speak to them? Because they wouldn't listen. 
Silence was in some ways God's judgment on the people of this time. But things were about to change because a little boy listened to the voice of God and obeyed what he said. Samuel would be described as being faithful. How many of you understand that God rewards faithfulness? He rewards faithfulness. He rewards people who listen. So let's look at Samuel's life and see what we can draw from this little boy on what made him end up being who he was. And the first is, in my estimation, he had an attentive ear. One uh, mark of a, of a faithful servant is they are attentive to God's voice and they immediately respond. Samuel had not heard from God, so he didn't know who was speaking to him. But Eli, this old mentor, helped him to understand that this is probably God trying to speak to you. And the boy responded appropriately as Eli helped him to respond. So that when the last time he spoke, Samuel just simply said, speak, your servant's listening. I have a listening ear. I want to hear, God, what you have to say to me. An ear turned to the Bible, what the Bible calls a still, small voice is critical. The second thing that I think that we can learn from Samuel is that he had an obedient will. He, he, he did what he heard God telling him to do. Here I am. Speak to me. Let me hear. I'll do what you say. As I think about our culture right now, I'm reminded of a time that actually was a precursor to when I came to know Jesus. Uh, it, it's a time that we call the Jesus Movement. And a bunch of young people started to get saved, and many of them were hippies. They were, they were out there on the fringe of culture, and they started getting saved, and they started showing up at church, and they started asking the pastors and leaders of the church, when are we going to start doing the stuff? And the pastors are going, what do you mean by the stuff? When are we going to start praying for people? When are we going to start setting captives free? When are we going to start feeding people? When are we going to start building uh, wells? When are we going to start living this thing out? radically changed our culture. Happened in the late 60s. The church is still filled with old timers like me who are remnants of that culture. I think it's time for a new Jesus movement. Here I am. Send me. Samuel had a humble heart. What I didn't read to you is that Samuel did not jump up and down and start running around telling everybody he heard from God. As a matter of fact, he laid down, contemplated, let it roll around in him, woke up the next morning and just started doing what he normally did. And Eli actually had to come to him and ask him, what was said? What did God say to you? And that's interesting because most 12-year-old boys would be blabbering like crazy that God spoke to me. But this humble little man hid these things in his heart and just started doing the things that God told him to do. You know, one of the things that I think we in Western culture, which means us Americans, need to recognize, it's not about us. It's about Jesus. We want to make him famous. It's not about us being famous. The next thing that I would say about Samuel is that he had a godly walk. A few ch chapters later, it just simply says that God was with him. And he influenced an entire nation and is still influencing the church today, thousands of years later. Look what God has done through that little boy who he spoke to. So here's my second story. I was in the bathroom several weeks ago. Uh, my wife was a little bit concerned when I told her I was telling a bathroom story, but I need to explain, especially to you ladies, the bathroom at Yakima Foursquare Church because when you walk in the door and get into the bathroom part of our bathrooms, there are three on-the-wall urinals that only men get to use. And the first one is a low one for little people. And the second two are high ones for adults. And I walked in there, and because the low one is closer to the door, that's the one I went to. And I'm just minding my own business when I hear the door open. And all of a sudden, I realize as the door closed, and I don't know where that person is that just came through the doors, that somebody is boring a hole in the back of my head. So I turn around, and here's this little man looking up at me. Because I'm at the little man urinal. And he says to me, 
what are you doing at that one? (laughs) So here's the application from the bathrooms at Yakima Foursquare for your life. Are you where you're supposed to be? Isn't that good? Huh? Did you see that coming? No. No. Well, let me tell you something about me. I don't learn anything very quickly. So I was just at some meetings last week, and I went to the urinal. This one had 10 of them with the low one at the front. And I run in and go right to the low one at the front. And the same experience, I realize somebody's behind me staring a hole in my back. And it's two little Jewish boys. They have the, the little hat on. It's, it's called a kippah. And they're staring at me, but they're both doing the potty dance. I mean, they really got to go. They're kind of like, what are you doing at that one and I realized and here's the application for you isn't this fun (laughs) when we're not where we're supposed to be we actually harm people we actually harm people one of the most frequently used words in our culture is trauma we are in a trauma filled culture And oftentimes it comes from the people that are supposed to love us the most. Are you where you're supposed to be? So here's my question. How does God speak to you? How do you hear from God? I believe my job as a pastor and as a leader is to cause the people around me to understand how God, like Eli, understand how God speaks to you. Because we're all unique, and we all need to understand how God speaks to us. People say things like, God spoke to me, or the Lord told me, and what does that mean? Did they hear an audible voice like Samuel heard an audible voice? How do we hear from God? So I want to share with you some ways that I think that God speaks to us today in the culture that we live in. And the first and very important one is that God speaks to us through the Scripture, Through our Bibles, he gave us this thing to speak to us. In 2 Timothy, it says, All scriptures God breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness, faithfulness, so that the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. I don't know if you know this, but I love this about our culture. We measure everything. And if you will read your Bible four times a week, you will be transformed is what they've they've come to understand as they've studied our culture. People that read their Bible four times a week are transformed. It will change you. So that's the first way that I would suggest to you that God speaks to us. The second is that God speaks through gifted teachers whose source is the Bible. We always have to understand and know our Bibles so that we know that the people talking to us are actually preaching out of the Bible. Lots of cults have been raised up and caused incredible harm. I go to a lot of churches in my new position. I oversee close to 300 churches. I want you to understand, I believe this is one of the best of them. I love my leaders, Jacob and Chantal. I love them. They're doing a great job. I love listening to them. I pray for them. But as I go into all of these churches, we are as diverse as you can possibly imagine. And I always pull into a parking spot and I pause and I pray, God, you have something to say to me today. I don't want to go into this church and critique their worship. I don't want to go into this place and and critique what the pastor is saying. I don't want to go in and try to find all the flaws of that church. I want to go in and sit there, and I want to receive a pearl from you, God. So would you prepare my heart to receive from you today? Because you're going to use this church to change me. Would you do that? And I have never been disappointed. And I've seen some crazy stuff. (laughs) But God speaks. So the third possibility, the thing I think, that God speaks to us through difficulties. Through difficulties. We were talking about this recently. The pandemic that we are in has ravaged the church. The, the, The church in the United States has been ravaged. Leaders have been 
incredibly affected by this because the, the sheep have turned on the shepherds. I had one pastor say to me, I did not know that sheep were carnivores because they've turned on the leadership because of the way they've tried to lead through the pandemic. My favorite statement is one of our pastors who said, you know, this is my first pandemic. I'll try to do better next time. <laughs> but what is God doing? What do we do in response to this? And here's the reality of what I see and what I've experienced. God will take us to hard places to get our attention. God will take us to the walls of our life and say, I want you to deal with this thing. God will literally pry our fingers off of things that we are holding too tightly to because he absolutely loves you the way you are, but he's not going to leave you that way. He has intents to purify and set you free so that you can be all that he intended you to be. And it's not fun, but you're free and it's over. So the next way I think that God speaks is through the Holy Spirit, that still small voice. John said this, that follower of Jesus, but the advocate, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you all things and will remind you of everything I've said to you. Jesus said, I'm gonna send this helper. And when we say yes to Jesus, when we pray that prayer that says, Jesus, would you take me? The Holy Spirit comes and begins to work and to speak and actually literally resides in us, that still small voice. And again, we pray to tune our ears to hear what he had to say. One of the ways is through a thing that is called listening prayer. Uh, I, I try to do a lot of that. Try not to speak so much, but try to listen. I actually went to Rimrock several weeks ago because it's a place through the course of my Christian life of over 40 years that I go when I really want to hear from God. It's up above Rimrock. It's a big rock, and I sit there and just look at creation and let God speak to me. Now, that particular day was in the middle of that crazy, crazy rainstorm, and the wind was blowing about 100 miles an hour, so as I crested the top of that rock and the rain was peeling the skin off of my face, I just simply said to, Lord, to the Lord, you're going to have to talk quick because I'm not staying here very long. <laughs> Do you have a spiritual discipline of prayer? And I've never heard an audible voice, never. But I have sensed God moving and telling me I'm going in the right direction. Which leads me to the next way that I believe God speaks, and that's through his creation. Through his creation. If you ever doubted that there was a God, just go outside and really take in creation. And then tell me that it just happened. Tell me, hey, this all just happened. Years ago, I just began to describe it as the butt in the sky theory. Because evolutionists say there was gas somewhere. Well, if there was gas somewhere, there had to be a butt. It takes more faith to believe that than it does to understand and to know that there's a creator and watch creation work and say that there's no God and if he can do that and he loves me more than he loves that, why won't he deal with me? He will deal with me and he has. And the last way that I'll share with you today and I'll be done, God speaks through whatever or whomever he chooses but it's never in disagreement with the Bible. Again, you've got to know your Bible to know if what's happening around you is really a God thing. For God does speak. We are big on community around here because we believe that God is big on community and he wants us to have people around us. Uh, good friends who will stab us in the front, not stab us in the back. Good friends who will look at us and tell us when they see things in our life that maybe our difficulties for them. Good friends who will lift us up when things are bad. Good friends who will weep with us when we weep and good friends who will pray for us when we're discouraged. Good friends who will walk through life with us. We do everything we can to pro provide that kind of community for you. In just a few minutes, some people are gonna come to the front of this church to pray for you. Most of you will head out those back doors, but these people pray all week that God will use them in a miraculous way to speak 
into the life of somebody that's hurting and needs prayer. That's how God works. He's still doing the stuff, and we see supernatural things happen at the front of this church. And I would suggest to you that sometimes we don't need, I mean, people don't even realize when God is using them to speak into another person's life, which is why our words are so important and so critical. They have the power of life and death, our words do, to cause trauma or to bring life. And again, sometimes it comes from the most unlikely places. I spend a ton of time with my grandkids because I just marvel at who God is as I watch these little people try to navigate life and understand life and see life. You need to put yourself in community because God will speak to you through others. So here's my last story. Several years ago, I started to realize I have no energy. I would sit down and just simply fall asleep. I started to actually feel like maybe I'm battling depression or something. Something's going haywire in my life. And my beautiful bride knew something was wrong. So she set me up. And she set me up. She deceived me. I want you to all know that about her. She is willing to do that. And sent me to a doctor whose office was right next to the hospital. And when I went to that doctor, they gave me an EKG to check my heart. And the doctor came out and said, Mr. Edler, you can either drive yourself to the emergency room or we'll call an ambulance because you are in AFib. Your heart's not beating correctly. And two years later, battling through that, they were practicing medicine on me. I finally got to a place where two weeks ago they put a pacemaker in my chest and now my heart is beating the way it's supposed to again. And I am a transformed, changed man because of medical science. So can I apply that to your life? Is your heart right? Because the heart is the center of our being. It's the very center of who we are. Is it completely and fully abandoned to Jesus? Because you will only be able to hear God and your life will only be what it's supposed to be in when the great physician has been working on you. Let me pray. Father, I'm grateful for this opportunity, grateful for this day. I too, uh, man, I meld my prayers with all the others who pray that this gift to the world just radically continues to transform our world because of the crazy willingness of a group of people in Yakima to spend less on themselves and give to you. And Lord, I pray, would you help us to understand what we may need to change? Would you help us to understand whether we're in the right place? Would you help us to understand if our hearts are right? Lord, would you speak? Holy Spirit, would you come into this very room and speak? I believe that the reality of a room like this is that many of your hearts are broken. Uh, many of your lives have been disrupted and are difficult. Lots of reasons cause us to live in those traumatic places. But I want you to understand that I believe with everything in my being that God is still doing the stuff and he still wants to touch you and he still wants to change you radically. So as heads are bowed and eyes are closed, if, if you're somebody in this place that is battling anything that is making life and you recognize I'm not where I'm supposed to be and you want to be where you're supposed to be, would you just lift your hand and say, that's me. That's me. I see those hands. 
let me understand what you've just done because it was very dangerous. You just said to God, touch my life. And he's going to do it. He's going to do it. You have to listen. You have to carefully listen, but he's going to do it. And you have to obey. So let him do that. We always give this opportunity here. If you're here and you've never said yes to Jesus, you've never opened your heart to his spirit, heads are bowed and eyes are closed, I want to give you an opportunity to make that decision. And all I'm going to ask you to do is lift your hand and say, that's me. I need to start walking with Jesus. I haven't been doing that. I need to start. I need to give my life to him. I need to walk with him. Anybody at all? Well, let me suggest to you that one of the times that many of our friends and family who don't know Jesus will actually come with us to church is Christmas Eve. Extend an invitation to them. See if you can't get them to come through the doors of this place because the gospel will be presented and they'll be given an opportunity to receive him. Father, would you bless these people as they leave this place today? Would you pour your spirit out upon them and give them life and life to the full? Would you take them to places of healing and wholeness that they've never understood? Would you in powerful, powerful ways use them to affect the world that we live in? In Jesus' name. Amen.